Hello everyone and welcome to British Murders, the podcast that focuses exclusively on British murder cases and serial killers. I'm your host Stuart Blues and this is the third episode of season 8. This week's case was suggested via messenger by listener Matthew Stanley. We're back in the city of Nottingham this week, a place we have visited before on British Murders. I'd usually run through some quickfire facts at this point about our location, but I gave you five last time. Instead, I'm going to point you in the direction of my episode covering the murder of Matthew Pike. If you want to hear some facts about Nottingham, check out that episode. It was episode five of season six. Let me quickly advise you that this podcast contains elements that may be alarming to some listeners. As always, listener discretion is advised. If I had to describe this week's story using three words, I'd say tragic love triangle. It truly is a devastating story for all involved, and bizarrely, it's a case that seems to have almost been lost to the annals of time. Aside from brief mentions in the odd blog post, there's limited information about this case available online. However, a deep dive into the British newspaper archive allowed me to piece together the chain of events. The first person I'm introducing this week is a woman named Lynn Goldingay, who was born and raised in Nottingham. I believe her surname is pronounced Goldingay as opposed to Goldingay, so that's how I'm going to say it going forward. I could be wrong, but I'm rolling with it. Lynn's mum and dad were named Eunice and Lionel, respectively, and she also had a brother named Robert. I can't offer any more information on the members of her family, but what I can tell you is that Lynn attended what is now known as the Carlton Academy, a secondary education school in Nottingham. Back in Lynn's day, she was born in 1960 or 1961 for reference, the school was known as Frank Weldon Comprehensive, and there's a Facebook group for its alumni called I Went to Frank Weldon Comp and Survived. I'm showing my age here, but apparently a famous gaming YouTuber called Tommy Innit hails from Nottingham, attended the school in more recent times. Just the 11.8 million subscribers for young Tommy. No biggie. An intelligent and naturally beautiful girl, Lynn was sought after by many of her male peers. She was the full package. Eunice and Lionel were confident that their daughter would go on to achieve great things if her studies were anything to go by. Lynn was 17 when she sat her O-levels, the precursor of GCSEs, though I couldn't find her results. She must have got good grades as she continued to further her education at Digby College. That might have been what the locals called Arnold and Carlton College, as it was located on Digby Avenue in Mapley, Nottingham, until its closure on September 1st, 1999. At Digby, Lynn took a secretarial course of some description and finished her two-year stint there with sufficient qualifications to allow her to secure a role with a local accountancy firm. After working at the firm for 18 months, Lynn decided she wanted a new challenge. Rather than sticking with one company, she decided to start temping and was soon placed with DW Fip & Co, another local accountancy firm. Being the extrovert she was, Lynn soon won over her colleagues and the higher-ups at the firm, so much so that they offered her a full-time position which she duly accepted. Outside of her 9-to-5 job, Lynn was a creative woman who had a passion for both music and photography. She regularly attended concerts and the escapism no doubt brought her real joy. It was at a pop concert where Lynn, who had attended it with her boyfriend, met the second person I'm introducing this week. Born in roughly 1954, Graham Neal was his name, and like Lynn, he was a massive music lover. The pair clicked instantly, and within a month, Lynn had left her boyfriend and started dating Graham. Things moved at lightning speed for the new couple. They were living together in no time and acted like a happily married couple, despite never tying the knot. Graham got on famously with Eunice and Lionel to the point where they considered him part of the family. Lionel once said of the pair's frequent attendance at concerts, they were always going off to see some singer or some group somewhere. There's a reason for that and it's not as simple as saying they were both obsessed with music. Graham had formed close friendships with many of the UK's top pop stars due to being a popular DJ at Nottingham-based Radio Trent. I'm jumping the gun a bit though, so let's Craig David for a minute. Rather than seeking further education, Graham Neal went straight into full-time work after finishing high school. His first proper job saw him earn a wage working for the post office. In what capacity? I don't know. As he got older, Graham decided to pursue a career in the music business and got his foot in the door by becoming an engineer. 
Back in the 70s, there used to be a weekly newspaper in the UK called Sounds, which focused on the pop and rock music genres. Its gimmick was to give away music posters in the middle of each paper. Graham, at some point, became involved with Sounds and began writing reviews of local bands. He also interviewed UK pop stars for the paper and started making a name for himself in the music biz. His next career step was to use his engineering know-how by joining BBC Radio Nottingham as a sound engineer. With his foot now firmly in the radio door, Graham briefly moved down to London to work on a show called Rock On, the station's rock music show, before moving back up to Nottingham and joining Radio Trent. He may have also worked for BBC Radio Leicester at the same time, but most of his radio career was spent at Trent. Graham created a rock music show called Castle Rock, which was reportedly the only nightly indie rock show outside of London. It was very popular. Many stars of the 70s and 80s appeared on the show to promote the annual Monsters of Rock Festival at Donington Park in Leicestershire. Monsters of Rock is now known as Download, the most popular rock and heavy metal festival in the UK. Let's bring Lynn back into the story. Working backwards, according to my research, she moved into Graham's snazzy bungalow in the early 80s and remained there until January 1985. The bungalow was located at Brandcaster Close in the area of Cinderhill. Having secured a part-time receptionist job at Radio Trent, the couple saw each other practically 24-7, and theirs seemed like the perfect relationship. Graham would often secure free tickets to concerts, especially those of his close friend Paul Young. British singer-songwriter Paul Young was the frontman of a band called Q-Tips, but his career only saw real success when he became a solo artist in the early 80s. It said in my research that Graham Neal helped launch Paul's career by regularly playing his songs on the radio and having him on as a guest. How much credit Graham can take, I suppose is only known by Paul. Graham thrived at the thought of promoting undiscovered talent, especially if they were Nottingham-based, and he dreamed that a band from the area would make it to the big time. He even produced an album in 1984 featuring songs performed by local bands in an attempt to make his dream a reality. Sadly, nothing came of it. If anyone listening is from Nottingham, please get in touch and let me know who, in your opinion, is the biggest music artist from Nottingham. Nobody springs to my mind. I mentioned earlier that Lynn lived with Graham at his bungalow until January 1985. It was during that month that she decided to end the relationship, but what Graham didn't know was that it was because she'd met another man. That brings me to the third person I need to introduce this week. Duncan McCracken was a trainee accountant at DW Fip & Co, the same place Lynn worked as a receptionist, who lived not far from his parents, James and Anne, in Mapperley Park, Nottingham. James, or should I say Dr. James McCracken, was a well-respected doctor, something the local papers back in 1985 constantly brought up for some reason whenever referring to Duncan. One of four children to his parents, Duncan first met Lynn at work, and their relationship escalated during a party a few weeks before Christmas in 1984. Duncan was either 20 or 21 at the time and fell madly in love with Lynn, and boy did he let her know. To Duncan, Lynn was the first woman to have ever shown an interest in him, and the last thing he wanted to do was to let that slip through his fingers. The only problem was that Lynn was in a relationship with Graham when she started seeing Duncan. When Lynn broke things off with Graham, he asked her where she would go, to which she replied she would be staying with her mum. The truth was that Lynn would be moving straight in with Duncan at his house on Arlington Drive. From what I could deduce, it seems Duncan was well aware of Graham Neal's existence and Lynn's relationship with him, but Graham had no idea that Duncan existed. Lynn's parents were also kept in the loop, however they were deeply upset that Graham was no longer in a relationship with their daughter. They far from approved with Lynn's relationship with Duncan, perhaps because he was four years younger than her and a decade younger than Graham. It doesn't appear that Lynn was as in love with Duncan as he was with her, despite the pair planning to purchase a house together. I say that because in February 1985, Lynn sent Graham a Valentine's Day card with a handwritten message inside that read, The moments I love best are moments spent with you. Honest. In what must have been an incredibly difficult conversation, Lynn explained to Duncan that she felt like she needed to give things one more go with Graham before committing to buying a house. She said it was the only way she could be sure she was making the right decision. Feeling confident in their relationship, Duncan agreed with Lynn's logic and she got back in touch with Graham. 
On March 24th, 1985, Lynn moved back in with Graham and planned to stay there for just a few days. She was there for three days in total, but spent one of them house hunting with Duncan. On the third day, Lynn was about to pack her bags and head back to Duncan's place before Graham arrived home with two tickets to a Paul Young concert that evening. Unsure what to do, Lynn contacted Duncan, who persuaded her to take Graham up on the offer, as he could see no harm in her going with him. Graham and Lynn enjoyed the concert by all accounts, and spent some time backstage after the gig chatting with Paul and other pop stars. Within a couple of hours, tragedy would strike. A heated argument back at Graham's bungalow, during which Lynn supposedly mocked Graham's sexual prowess and informed him that there was only one man in her life, and it wasn't him. That's Graham's version of events, and sadly, it's the only version we have. I'll leave it up to you as to whether you believe it or not. Seeing the proverbial red mist, Graham grabbed a nearby hammer from his bedroom side table and repeatedly struck Lynn on the head with it. He said the hammer was in his bedroom because he'd recently repaired a light fitting. Graham only stopped attacking Lynn when her body became motionless. It was at that point he realised he'd killed her. Rather than phoning the police, Graham left Lynn's body in his bed and carried on with his life as normal. He went to work at Radio Trent the following day, March 26th, and some of his colleagues recall him being ashen-faced and nervous that day. One witness recalled Graham waiting for the lift whilst carrying a vacuum cleaner with no shoes on. That seems a tad random, but it's something I deemed worth mentioning. If it's true, it shows just how shocked Graham was after committing such a heinous crime against the woman he claimed to love. He was panicked and acting irrationally. Once his shift had finished, Graham went home and wrapped Lynn's body in bedding, placed it in his car, and headed for the Ratcliffe on Saw power station. It was near that coal-fired power station that Graham dug a shallow grave and attempted to bury Lynn's body. When Lynn failed to turn up for work on the morning of March 26th, she was reported missing. The police soon turned up at Graham's bungalow and asked him questions about the last time he'd seen her. Lying, Graham told the officers that Lynn had been with him the previous evening but had left that morning and headed for a bus stop, presumably on her way to work. The bungalow was briefly searched but no clues or evidence were found. On March 29th, 1985, four days after her murder, Lynn was reported missing by Graham. Police officers asked him some more serious questions about what he knew, given how long it had taken him to report Lynn missing, and at first he denied any knowledge. That soon changed. Graham suddenly confessed to having killed Lynn and buried a body in a shallow grave near the power station. He led officers right to the burial site, ending their search. As Graham was taken into custody and charged with Lynn's murder, her body was identified at Nottingham General Hospital by her brother Robert. Duncan reacted to the news incredibly badly. He would continually visit the flat he shared with Lynn and break down in front of what was essentially a shrine he'd created in her memory. He became severely depressed, not only at Lynn's death, but because he felt responsible for it. Had he not encouraged her to go to the Paul Young concert with Graham, she may still be alive. That thought was constantly going through Duncan's mind. Graham made a £20,000 bail application on May 8th, 1985, it's around £56,500 in today's money, but Mr Justice Wolfe rejected it. On May 29th, 1985, Graham was lying on his remand prison bed when he heard a news bulletin on the radio. The boyfriend of the recently murdered 24-year-old Lynn Goldingay had chosen to take his own life through carbon monoxide poisoning. Duncan had driven his car inside a garage, placed a pipe over the exhaust, fed it through a small gap in the driver's side window, turned the car engine on, and then naturally fell asleep due to the fumes. Deputy Coroner Peter Jenkin Jones confirmed Duncan's cause of death as suicide. He had absorbed a carbon monoxide saturation of 71%. It would later be revealed that Duncan had spent five weeks planning his death and had compiled a suicide note for his family. The last words Duncan said to his dad were, I want to be cremated. I assume those letters were said within the letter rather than in person. When Graham heard the news, he was both shocked and devastated. When I said earlier that Graham had no idea that Duncan existed, I meant it. Graham initially thought the news bulletin was about him. Hearing of Duncan's tragic suicide led to Graham becoming depressed, and he chose the same fate as the young man. At 7.10am on June 6, 1985, Graham Neal was discovered hanging from a beam in his cell on Lincoln Prison's hospital wing. He had used his bedsheets to form a makeshift noose. 
According to Peter Holland, a fellow prisoner at Lincoln, Graham feared he would receive a life sentence after hearing of Duncan's death. Before he knew Duncan existed, he felt he would only get three or four years. That logic seems flawed, and it's worth remembering that testimony came from one of Graham's prison buddies. It's therefore considered to be rather unreliable information. On June 7th, 1985, the day after Graham took his own life, an inquest into his death occurred, as did Duncan McCracken's funeral at St. Martin's Church in Sherwood. This next part literally made me yell out, what the fuck, when researching it. June 12th, 1985 was the day Lynn Goldinger was due to be cremated. In some mad twist of fate, it was also the same day Graham's family had scheduled his cremation. Worse still, both cremations were scheduled to take place at the same crematorium, Wilford Hill. Their respective services would have originally occurred only 30 minutes apart had the undertakers on Lynn's side not noticed the day's schedule. Thankfully, Lynn's service was brought forward to 10.45am that day, with Graham's remaining scheduled to begin at 2.15pm. I still find that incredibly uncomfortable to hear, even though it was nothing more than an unfortunate coincidence. Imagine nobody had noticed though. Lynn's family just bumps into Graham's family while they're waiting for their service to begin and Lynn's family's has just ended. It's unthinkable. On June 19th, 1985, Nottinghamshire coroner Mr. John Langham recorded a verdict of unlawful killing regarding Lynn Goldingay. It's worth noting that Home Office pathologist Dr. Stephen Jones explained that Lynn had some considerable bruising on her body, which indicated that she had put up as good a fight as she could against Graham. One thing's for sure, this tragic love triangle case is one of the strangest I've ever come across. And that was a story of British murderer Graham Neal. Thanks again, Matthew Stanley, for suggesting that case. That's it for another episode. I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time. Cheerio.